Good morning, Rise. How are we doing this morning? All right. All right. Wait a minute. So we've got a God who left the comforts of heaven, came down here because he loved you so much that he lived a perfect life and went to a cross for you that you might be saved, redeemed, stored, and given new life. How are you doing this morning? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Man, yes, yes, that's how we're doing this morning, right? We just got to remind ourselves sometime. I am doing so well this morning. In my quiet time, I sat down with the Holy Spirit, and I encouraged him. How's that? Now, some of you are saying, ooh, can you say that? Yeah, I asked him if I could say it before. I could do it. I'm doing so well this morning, one more, I got one more, that I attacked Satan and didn't wait for him to attack me, amen? <laughs> All right. God is good. He is so good, and I just am so glad to gather with you this morning and praise him, hear from his word, and allow him to fill us up, because we know he is the greatest encourager, right? In all seriousness, he's done all he could ever do for us to prove his love for us, and every time we get to sit down and open the word and, or pray and look up to him, we're talking to the, the power, the creator of the universe who can speak life into our heart. That's an awesome God, and that's the one we're worshiping. That's the one we're going to hear from today and continue to live for today. He is great. When you came in, I would hope you would have gotten a trifolded, is that, did I say that right? Trifolded? See, I know stuff like that. I have a trifolded sheet of paper here that is our mission commitment sheet, we call it. We were going to say cards, but it's not a card, it's a sheet. And we are going to ask that you take this home and simply ask God what you want to do. I mean, if the Holy Spirit, we, as you know, over several weeks, we heard from our missionaries. We've got, we've got a young man at the University of um, Indiana who is, is changing lives on that campus, including a variety of international students who will take that work uh, to their countries. We heard from a gentleman who is encouraging, actually, people who work on college campuses, coaching them and encouraging them, helping them raise support. And then we heard from a, a couple, we heard a couple that was doing that, along with a, his wife who's in the prayer ministry, and then another couple who is serving out in the darkness of the Amazon in Venezuela. In, an, in just an incredibly tough circumstances, and they're speaking life and light to the people that live there. And uh, I just believe that we have an opportunity to have worldwide impact at RISE, and so what we're asking you to do is simply take this sheet home, ask the Holy Spirit what he would like you to give. Um, we're just asking that you open your heart to what God would have you do uh, for these missionaries. That will help dictate how much we're able to support them. And, you know, we can't be necessarily in the Amazon. We can do our ministry here. We will continue to shine our light in the Milwaukee area and reach people here. But as we do, we can't be at the University of Indiana and here. We can't be in the Amazon and here. What we can do is support the people who are there making a difference for Jesus. And so their livelihood depends on churches being generous and obedient. And uh, as if you look at the, the verse we have on here, which it says in Romans 10, 14, and 15b, it says, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? And I would follow that with how can they be sustained if they're not supported by the local church? so the word can keep going out. That's what it's about, right? Let's make our lives about the word going out. As long as we have breath, we want the word of God to go out. So we're just asking that you, you take a look at this, that there's a, a commitment statement here where there's some amounts, including an other. And let's say you're in a financial position where it says, I don't even, I, I can't even give $10. You know what? There's an other line. You could put $2. And if you give $2 a week, that, that comes to... $104? See, I, I, I took math in college. That's a, so uh, that, that, that's, that's significant to a family, you know? That's, that's a couple pairs of shoes or something, you know? Just don't think there's a gift too small, right? And if you're someone who God has blessed, and maybe you're thinking, you know, I am so blessed here, and I think of their situation, maybe he'd give you a number that you're surprised that you would even write down. Who knows? Just do what God wants you to do. That's all. What I often say when I talk about giving, and it's my heart, I don't want you to give one more cent than God wants you to give. I just don't want you to give one cent less. 
because I want us to all experience the blessings of, of what Christ can do. So there's, a, there's an amount here, there's an a, a interval here, weekly, monthly, yearly, and then, you, what, and then, then there's an opportunity to commit to prayer, pray for them as well. And the, but you keep all of that as your reminder to your commitment to God, and then just tear off the bottom part and, and turn it, fill that out, turn it into us. It can be next week, it can be when, whenever God leads you. Um, obviously, the sooner that we can include it in the budget, the better, but as God, the better, best time is after God has spoken to you, whenever that is. Does that make sense? All right, we will trust God. And as I, as I transition from that to our message, let's just pray for our missionaries this morning. Let's do that. Let's lift them up, and let's ask that God would sustain them and encourage them. Because that's that same God that we're, that we're celebrating here today. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you. You are so good. You're a great God. And you're a God worthy of worship and praise and honor and glory. And you're, you're worthy of praise and glory from every corner of the world. And Lord, we believe you've called us to worldwide impact. And I just pray for those missionaries this morning, God. I pray, Lord, that you would, you would encourage each of them. And I pray, Father, you give them strength. I pray you give them wisdom. I pray, God, that your, your presence will be obvious and you go before them in their ministries, that they would be fruitful and encouraged and lifted. I pray for their health. I pray for protection against the enemy. And we pray, God, that you would help them to allow, through your grace, through your provision, may 2024 be the best year they've ever experienced in ministry with the most joy and the most fruit. And I pray, God, that you'd speak to each one of us in our hearts, Lord. We have it so good. We are so blessed as we sit here. I pray, God, you'd speak to us. About, about a number that we can give to support them, to make a difference for them and have worldwide impact for the kingdom. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. And all God's people said, amen, amen. All right, well, we are moving into another of our series today as we continue to, continue to move through our series of the power of boldness. And this morning we're gonna talk about bold encouragement. And I want to stop, to kind of switch the, switch the focus for a moment, and something you don't really think about when you think about encouragement, and that is weapons. You know, here's the thing about weapons. They can be used for good, or they can be used for bad, right? A sharp knife, for example, can be used to cut a nice steak, or to stab your spouse. Not to plant any ideas. Don't be doing that. that that's the bad. Steak good, spouse bad, right? <laughs> there's, there's good and there's bad. Just, it's my point, right? <laughs> a gun, same thing. A gun is like a knife. It's just a bunch of metal. It can be, it can be used to, to murder, which would be bad, obviously, or it could be used to protect your family against being murdered, right? It, 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 the, it's just a piece of metal. But here's the thing. There's a weapon that does more harm than the, all the guns and the knives in the world. Not in terms of death, but in terms of day-to-day -day impact on the lives of others. It's not made of steel, it's made of flesh, and it's called the tongue. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. See, apparently King Solomon, when he wrote this, wasn't aware of that playground saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? But we know that's not true. It's a good thing to say to a bully when, when he's in your face and he's hurt you, because you want to just let him know, hey, you're not getting to me, stop. But we know it's, we know it's not true. The tongue has the power of life and death, in that a t with our tongue we can lift someone up and speak life into their lives. Or with our tongue we can tear someone down and make them die just a little bit inside. We have the capacity to do both. There's encouragers in this world who are really good at lifting people up and encouraging them. Giving them courage, encourage, the word courage is in there. And that's what encouraging is, is to build courage into someone's life. And, and when you're encouraging someone, that's what you're doing. You're giving them courage to face this day. You're lifting them to face whatever they're, whatever they're walking through. And that's what an encourager does. And so you have that opportunity to do that. You can encourage others. And then there's people who discourage people, 
who, who kill, if you will, their dreams, their hopes through criticism and through those types of things. You, you have people who will, who will simply tear down instead of build up. And here's the scariest part. You and I, we can be either one. Depending on the day, depending on the moment, depending on how much self-control we are, we are um, exerting at the time, we can be either one. Probably no surprise to you that the greatest encourager of all time was Jesus Christ. He used his tongue to bring life to people. He, this morning we're going to look to just to introduce the topic at the fifth chapter of Mark. And we picked up, pick up Jesus as he's walking along in Capernaum. Capernaum is a, a prosperous fishing village. It is um, north of the Sea of Galilee. It's a, it's a port also where a lot of goods and services from Egypt and Syria and beyond come in, primarily known for fishing. Mostly Jews live there. So it's, it's north of the Sea of Galilee. And it had about 1,500 people, just to give you the, the scene. And Jesus is walking along, and, and when we pick him up, he has just healed a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. And that was a big stigma back then. It was a big stigma. They were, they were ostracized. They were, it was a, a bad place to be when you had blood as a woman. And, and he, she had been suffering for 12 years, and he, he told her she had been healed. And so the crowd was gathering with him. The crowd was buzzing from this healing. He, he was walking along, and then a man named Jairus came up and talked to him and said, you got to help me. you got to help me. My daughter is dying. Please. Please help me, Jesus. I know what you can do. Please help me. And that's where we pick it up. In Mark 35, 35 and 36, the word says, While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And actually in the Greek, dead is actually placed first in the sentence, if you can imagine that, sort of for emphasis. So really what was said is dead is your daughter. Can't imagine poor Jairus in this moment. Blood rushing to his head, tears probably welling up in his eyes, panic, grief stricken, hearing that news that no parent ever wants to hear, probably the words we would dread the most. But being in Christ's presence gave the grief-stricken father hope. Jesus is seen here as the encourager. He was, as he had been showing his deity, as he had been walking among the people, healing and, and answering prayers, he, did, he refused to flaunt his power, but, but he was quick to glorify God through healing people. And I'm guessing when Jairus came up to him and then his then his friends and the people from his household came up to him and said, she's gone, she died. I'm guessing Jesus looked deep into her eyes and spoke those words of help. Don't fear. Don't fear. Only believe. And I believe that Jesus means to extend encouragement far beyond Jairus this morning. As we study this passage, I believe he's saying to you and I, despite all appearances, all this, when circumstances are painful, when they're overwhelming, I want you to know, Jesus said, I am aware and compassionate for your need. I work in my time, not others' time. I won't be hurried or I won't be dictated to, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to believe and I want you to watch what I do. Trust me, in other words. He's looking into our eyes and saying, trust me. My point in bringing this up isn't even the incredible back-to-life healing that Jesus did, because that's pretty amazing. But what I want to point out here is the fact that Jesus reached into the world of a man who was crushed by getting the news of the death of his daughter and encouraged him. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Trust me. Trust me. This wasn't a case of God telling Abraham, go, I'll tell you later where you're going. Just obey me, right? He didn't just say, go home, and not tell him what he found. He knew this man, this broken-hearted man, needed more, and he gave him more. And he said, don't be afraid. Just believe. Trust me. 
You and I, we can't command the dead to come to life. We can't do what Jesus did. But one thing we can do is we can reach into somebody's world and point them to Jesus. We can reach into someone's world and offer encouragement when they desperately need it. We can be the hands and feet and lips of Jesus when someone is hurting or down or overwhelmed. Author Jeannie Zenis writes the following. She wrote this. She said, I learned about the power of encouragement during one of the lowest times of my life. I was 30 and single, attending Bible college in my meager savings, fighting sickness, facing constant car repairs, and watching my parents battle cancer and heart problems. Then one morning, a professor asked for our prayers for some overwhelming things in his life. We were stunned into action. Don't you love that? Stunned into action. Sometimes when we're stunned, we just don't do anything. We're just stunned, right? They were stunned into action. Several of us formed an anonymous Barnabas committee, named for the New Testament son of encouragement. Throughout that semester, we sent our professor notes attached to little gifts like candy bars just to remind him that we were still praying for him. We did the same for other profs facing personal challenges. And as I helped encourage these teachers, I discovered the truth of Proverbs 11.25, which says, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. How awesome is that? He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Even though my problems didn't go away, they actually deepened when both my parents died a short time later. My reaching out to others helped keep my focus on God's love and God's power. If you struggle with depression or anxiety or, or maybe you just have a hard time staying positive and feel like you got hit down a little too easily, remember, put in your memory bank and sink into your heart, Proverbs 11.25, he, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And reach out to somebody. Reach out to somebody else. There is nothing better. There is no better way to end your own personal pity party than to go see somebody else, see somebody who has a need, and step in and make a difference for them. That is life-changing. The truth that produces consistent results is that when you are struggling, find someone else who's struggling. Focus on theirs and help them. Encourage them. Even the great Bible teacher, F.B. Meyer, just an amazing, phenomenal, educated guy, once remarked that if he could live his life over again, the one thing he would do, he'd spend more time encouraging others. Because it's true. It can be life-changing. You don't have to have a master's degree. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You simply need to be a person who cares about other people and will listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. This morning, I'm going to go through seven ways, kind of briefly, but I'm going to go through seven ways that we can be bold encouragers. The first is this, speaking. Obvious one, right? We start with the obvious, speaking. Proverbs 16, 24, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body, bringing healing to someone by telling them how you appreciate them and how you care about them or, or how, you, how you love how they do something. Just encouraging something with something positive. It could be something that makes their day. You know, I, I, I'm not soliciting encouragement or anything, but like after I've done a message and somebody comes up to me and says, hey, that made a difference for me today. Or I know if Pastor Susan's done worshiping and whatever, and you say, hey, you know, worship was awesome. It just brought me close to God. Those things, not because we need the personal affirmation that we're great, but what we wanted, all we want to do is know we made a difference for Jesus. That's it. And sometimes a simple word like that. But more importantly, there are people sitting in this room with you who could use a word of encouragement, a word just to know that they're noticed, that they're cared about, that they're loved. Encourage, just be an encourager. Speaking is one way. Writing is another. Have you ever noticed how in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul's letters, almost all of them, almost all of them have some level of encouragement in with, along with this instruction. Even some of that had the hardest instruction had some encouragement in there as well, right? Um, writing can be another, another form. Maybe you write a note to somebody. Maybe you send them a text. If the Holy Spirit prompts to your mind someone, and you know they're either, even if they're not going through something, even if you don't even know that if they're going through something, maybe it's just a sense of, of you know what? God wants me to reach out to this person. Let them know I appreciate them. I appreciate this about you. 
I appreciate how friendly you are on Sundays, always saying hello to people. I appreciate how kind you are. I appreciate your gentle spirit. It's not hard to find a positive in somebody, right? Just write, write. Feel free to send them a note, send them a text. Again, it could be just the blessing that person needs to be lifted on that day. It's one of the ways that helps us shine God's light. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 to 11 says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where I was going with the beginning question, how are you? <laughs> We're great. You know why? Because we are not destined for wrath, not because of us, but because of him who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. God wants us to be people who encourage each other. Take that extra step. What does it take to send a text like a minute? Unless you're me and then, you know, it takes me a long time. But what does it take most of you to send a text? Not long, right? Not long. All right, third is presence. Presence. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. You know, I believe as the church, we're the hands and feet of Jesus. Do you know someone who's lonely or sick or maybe shut in. Maybe just a visit to spend time with them. It doesn't have to be all day. It doesn't have to be for an hour. Just spending a few minutes with somebody who could be lifted. Maybe, maybe somebody's grieving and they lo- or somebody they really love is in the hospital and they're worried about them. Just to show up. And maybe you're, you're in a place where I don't even know what to say. Doesn't matter. Just show up. Let them know you care. Say, can I, I just say a prayer for you, or can I just hang with you just for a few minutes? I just want, just want to be here with you. Sometimes just that presence is so encouraging to others. Maybe somebody, maybe there's someone you know that is going through something, you don't really know what to say, but you, you know it's been a hard time, and just say, do you just want to have lunch together, or do you just want to, you want to hang out for a little bit, have a coffee, and just be with them. Feel them out. If they, they'll let you know if they need to talk. You can always offer to pray for them whatever you want to do, but the point, point here is, is spending time with people alone, without words even, can be valuable. Uh, social scientists say that only 25% of communication is verbal. There's other ways we can communicate that we care about somebody besides our words. Okay, the fourth. So we've got, we've got speaking, we've got writing, and we've got presence. The fourth is helping, helping. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your, say, good works. Let your light shine so they can see your good works. Why? Not for your glory. Give glory to your Father who's in heaven. For him, that our good works may bring glory to God. Sometimes people might feel overwhelmed and simply need a helping hand. Maybe you have an ordinary skill or a simple willingness to help out. You can encourage someone by giving them help in a time of need. You know, maybe you sew or mend or do odd jobs or can, or can go shopping for somebody. Maybe you can rock a baby for a, a tired new mom or drive somebody to the doctor when they're not feeling well or show up with a pickup truck so you know somebody's moving. You know, there's simple, practical things we can do that really encourage people just by showing up and do some simple helps. You know, the truth is, when you, do, when you step in like that, especially unexpected, if you step in and say, hey, let me help you with that. I'd like to help you with what's going on. Just kind of come over for a bit. It doesn't have to be all day again. It doesn't have to be all of your time. But, but just an cha- opportunity to help somebody, you know, it does two things. First, it gives them practical helps, which is always great, right? We've all been probably on the other end of that. But the other, it encourages them that they're not alone. It encourages them to help. There's other people who notice and care about me, what I'm going through. It's a powerful statement and a powerful way to encourage other people. Uh, number five is giving. Proverbs 21:26. This is about the fourth time, I think, in this series we've, we've used this. Proverbs 21:26. All day long he craves and craves, but the righteous gives and does not hold back. People who live with bold generosity can see people in situations and whether the person needs money or f- clothing or food or loaning equipment to them, just, they just have, say, whatever I've got, 
is, is those who need it, right? People who are generous, they've got that spirit. I've got this sitting in the garage. You, you need this. I'm going to get it to you so I, can, so I can help you out. Sometimes some people give beauty, like flowers, for example, bouquet of flowers. Uh, maybe they gather it in their yard or put it in a vase. You know, we have a flower ministry that John and Jan Jensen started here. And, and they'll, one, one lady a week will walk out. Do they do both services? Do they do two now? Now we do two. All right. Every, after every service, a lady's handed flowers. And, and just to encourage them, to let them know, hey, you're cared about. You know what? We notice you and we love you. How many ladies have ever walked out of here with a flower? I just want to say, look at that. Praise God. That's awesome. And that's, it's just a simple thing of giving and a way to touch people's lives. Six, hospitality. You know, this, men, this, this ministry and this, this gift is really best defined by the Greek word philozenia, philozenia. And, it, and what it really means is brotherly love of strangers. Sometimes we think about it as opening our home, and that can be one aspect of it, but that's not the whole thing with the, the Greek definition of the word for hospitality. It, it, it can really mean reaching out to someone that's, that's uh, it says stranger here, so I'll look at it, somebody maybe you're not even that familiar with, but reaching out and make a difference. Maybe it's providing a meal or an offer of help. It's reaching out to people on the outskirts. And maybe it's somebody who is temporarily on the outskirts, whether they went through a divorce or in a transition time of their life, and they're just feeling alone. And you're saying, you know what? I don't want that person to feel alone. That's probably that, that's probably that thought. And it's, it's, uh, it's an opportunity for you to reach in and make a difference and really be the church of Jesus Christ for them and, and part of it. Allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you in just however he would want you to to do it. And the truth is, is biblical hospitality can make a huge difference in the hard parts of times of our life. When we have a group of people or a person, even a couple people coming around somebody, when we're really in those low spots, it can change everything for us. Number seven, praying. Praying. 2 Corinthians 1.11, you must, you also must, as the Apostle Paul writing, help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. You help us by your prayers, Paul says. Praying for somebody is so huge. No matter what circumstances, prayer can and must be done for people. God hears prayers of his people, right? God hears the prayers of his people. And if you haven't, if you, again, if somebody puts, if God, the Holy Spirit puts God, somebody on your heart, and, and then it's, it's for sure time to pray for them. And then you can also ask, is there anything else you want me to do? But for sure, we can pray for them. One idea could jot prayer needs as you, you know, as you hear them, on your, maybe on your phone or a notebook or something, and just kind of put them down. I know people who have pretty long prayer lists, right? And they just pray for people every day, and lots of people, right? If you really keep track of all the people that are being pray, needed, need prayer, it's a long, long list. But I'm telling you, even if you just pray as they come in and you hear of somebody's need, whether even if it's not a formal prayer request, but this person's going through this, take a moment, pray, pray for them. They can make all the difference in the world. You know, um, be, if you can, you can write, you can pray, you can write a note, you can call, you can do helps, you can, you can encourage you can provide a meal for someone. You know, just remember I'm on low-sodium diet right now, but, but I still like a lot of food. <laughs> okay, let's land this thing here. I think it's time. I think it's time. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Right? When we wake up in the morning, we have a job. We have a, we have, none of us are unemployed. We can be abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. There is no greater encourager than Jesus himself. No, no one greater at reminding someone of God's love for them than Jesus himself. No one greater at reminding people of their own worth than Jesus himself. No one greater at reminding people that when they follow him, yes, there's great sacrifice but there is also hope in every situation they walk through. And I believe the Apostle Paul is telling us, along with sharing the gospel, we're to be steadfast in encouraging one another, immovable 
in both sharing the gospel and encouraging one another, both in tangible means and in reminding people who they are and how much our great, faithful God loves them. Because when we do, we are abounding in the work of the Lord. And when we do, we're becoming like Jesus. We're living like Jesus lived. And that's what we all right, want, right? We want to live like Jesus lived. We want to love like Jesus loves. We want to serve like Jesus served. We want to encourage like Jesus encouraged. Who is it that God wants you to encourage this week? A text, phone call? written note, praying, your presence, practical help, God will show you. Just ask him, who can I help? Who can I encourage this week? Ask God and then follow through. Be a doer of the word. If he gives you somebody, hey, give this person, shoot this person a text. Whatever it is, do what he says to do. It's more powerful than you think. And it's probably more like Jesus than we even know. Let's be like him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for you. You have blessed us so much. And among other things, you've blessed us with the opportunity to walk in your ways, to do, abound in your work. Lord, help us to be like you. Help us to seek you and, and live like you. And help us to be bold encouragers that we might bring light and love to others, that we might point them to you and we might encourage them. We love you and praise you. In the awesome name of Jesus, amen.